Hello, we're rolling into another episode of the DRH show. As usual, I talk to interesting people within psychology, mental health, and well-being. My brilliant guest for today is a relationship expert. In particular, he helps people recover from breakup. Dr. C.M. Sens, thanks for joining me. Hi, thanks for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Okay, thanks Thanks. thanks for accepting my invitation. Now, um, you have a really interesting thing uh, um, specialism um, but I just just want to learn more about about your background um, give us your trajectory in life on how you come came up doing what you're doing sure absolutely thanks um, so I initially start off in nonprofit work um, and then um, while I was getting my education got an undergrad in psychology uh, and then I got my master's in counseling and then finished up a doctorate degree in clinical psych. And there is when I had to start doing my research, obviously. And um, that's when kind of my, my career and my education uh, kind of crossed paths. Um, I was seeing a lot of clients who were um, getting out of difficult relationships, toxic relationships, um, and really struggling to let go, to move on, or even um, sometimes even deciding if they should let go and move on. And um, my research then um, kind of paralleled that. Um, the methods that I were using um, weren't really working uh, very well and weren't being very effective. And so my research surrounded uh, examining uh, romantic grief. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I started to dive into what are the most effective ways to heal from a relation re relationship based upon research. Mm -hmm. And... Um um, you just mentioned about romantic grief. Um, to be honest, I've never heard of that word before. And how is this romantic grief different from the kind of normal grief that we actually know about? Yeah, great question. Over the past 60 or 70 years, uh, that word grief has kind of just been the umbrella term that everything mm -hmm. falls under if you've experienced some type of loss in life. Um, and Really, what we're talking about is the ending of a relationship and, and the difference between that and, let's say, what is well known as loss of life grief when somebody mm -hmm. dies or somebody, a loved one um, dies. You know, um, the romantic grief, obviously, we're talking about a relationship, but we're also talking about non-finite grief. Mm -hmm. um, so that those non-tangible things that are associated uh, with the loss. It's not necessarily the loss itself. It's everything surrounding that loss. So, for example, if you're in a relationship, um, relationships are so fundamental to human growth and development. Um, mm -hmm. It is kind of the trajectory in life that people take as they grow and as they get older. Um, it becomes one of the main focuses in life is to find that partner and find that relationship. It's how you self-identify. We, we uh, relate to other people based upon being single, based upon being in a relationship. And so it's a huge part of development. When you are in a relationship, then um, there's all these things that are associated with it. Um, your future, your thoughts of where your life is going, how you identify yourself in the future, the plans that you have, the hopes and the dreams. And so um, the, that non-finite stuff is really what makes uh, romantic grief uh, different from loss of life grief. In mm -hmm. addition, um, the aspect of jealousy is unique to romantic grief. You don't see that in um, grief to, due to the loss of life. Um, the, uh, um, the concept of it being a rejection, that mm -hmm. somebody might end a relationship and you didn't want it to end. And so mm -hmm. that then feels like rejection. That's also unique to uh, romantic grief. And that concept of rejection is so important because that's that assault on the identity, on the ego, on the self, on how I view myself. I was receiving all this feedback from a relationship. It's how I define my self-worth and my identity. But all of a sudden that's gone and I feel that rejection. And so that's why um, recovery after romantic grief is so difficult some, sometimes for people because it contains those unique aspects that other forms of grief do not. Mm -hmm. Now you, you, you mentioned about, obviously you've been working on this for, um, I, I suppose, for quite some time and you're obviously an expert in this area. But if you could just talk us through what has been the traditional approach, you know, to helping individuals individuals who are experiencing romantic grief because obviously um this 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 is kind of like a, a new area you know like we, we don't really talk about um you know how to effectively 
he recovered from a romantic grief. So just just um, talk us through what has been the traditional approach and um, in your opinion, what what's wrong with the, sure. um, those approaches? Yeah, and, and nothing against uh, the the grief work that goes towards loss of life grief. Mm -hmm. But um, when that was started, I mean, Freud kind of has his heyday when he was kind of starting to do grief work. But really, it came to light in the 60s with uh, Kubler-Ross and the five stages of grief and her work surrounding um, mm -hmm. death and dying. And somehow that became very popular. And it became mm -hmm. the approach that everybody uses uh, when they're facing grief or when they're helping people through grief. Um, and so that's mm -hmm. kind of been the traditional response is that you need to go through these five stages of grief. And everybody's kind of, even in a popular culture, mainstream culture, mm -hmm. people are kind of familiar with those five stages, you know, denial, and then ultimately trying to get to acceptance of the grief. Um, mm -hmm. But the reason why that doesn't necessarily work is, number one, it wasn't intended to be applied to all forms of grief. When Kubler-Ross was doing her work, though, that was specific on people who were facing loss of life, whether because of a, a, a family member who had recently died or they had a terminal illness and they were preparing for death. Mm. And so her work really centered around specifically death and dying. And she, I, I can't speak for her, obviously, but I don't think her work was um, intended to be applied to all these areas of grief. And then um, even more specifically, somehow that got adopted into applying it into all forms of grief. But the five stages do not uh, approach those uh, unique characteristics that we mm -hmm. talked about just recently, um, that, that the aspect of jealousy. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't really talk about how to deal with jealousy, the aspect mm -hmm. of rejection and losing kind of that self-identity and how you relate to the world. Those five stages doesn't really um, cover that. Um, and more recently, as, as people have begun to research the five stages, um, it, it was an observation. It was, this is what I see when people are experiencing death and dying. And that's true. You do see those kind of characteristics of somebody preparing for death. Um, but it's a very passive way to deal with grief. It's kind of this waiting around for something to happen. You kind of feel your way through these feelings. You process your way through these feelings that occur and these stages that occur. And it's very linear. It's very, you start here and you kind of process your way through and you end here. And it's very passive. You're kind of waiting for healing to come. And so um, those are the reasons why it doesn't really necessarily apply to all forms of grief, specifically romantic grief. Even more uh, recently with the, the onset of social media and how big social media is, you know, when somebody dies, um, they're gone. And you have memories of them. You have things that remind you of them. You grieve and you and you honor them. But when it comes to relationships, sometimes that's not the case. Um, mm -hmm. You see somebody on Facebook. You see somebody on Instagram. You see the ex. Um, it's kind of you, you look for them sometimes. You have to see mm -hmm. them with somebody new. And all of these are things are kind of that are unique to romantic grief mm -hmm. that are difficult to uh, heal and to move on. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like what you mentioned mention about you know like seeing your ex on 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 facebook on so social media because it's something that really I, I suppose someone could really relate you yeah know, like um yeah and when we were trying to uh, uh we're talk talking about you know the traditional approach to um dealing with romantic grief i suppose back in the day they're not really talking about those um you know seeing your ex um on social media but what, what i want to um find out is that is there such a thing as like a normal grief and a complicated romantic grief because you know when we're talking about processing a grief with the death of a loved one I suppose there's such a thing as you know a complicated grief and w would you say that also holds true for romantic grief absolutely and um, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that question and what research has shown us is that people don't necessarily mm -hmm. go through all those stages if they do try to process these stages in mm -hmm. a linear fashion there's no order to it um, mm -hmm. You know, you think about somebody who has um, experienced the loss of a loved one who had possibly cancer. You know, they're already starting to process some of that grief long before the person dies. Mm -hmm. So it's not this kind of denial and then stage two and then stage three. And the same thing for romantic grief. There could be issues that surround an, um, the breakup that make it complicated. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people get stuck in these on-again, off-again relationships. Mm -hmm you know, where they try to make it work again. And so 
you're kind of re-traumatizing yourself sometimes. You you experience the loss, you get back together, you're still having those those feelings about breaking up the first time, and you're still trying to repair the relationship. So it's very complicated. And then in, in addition, you have infidelity. Somebody might cheat on somebody else. And so you have all of these other dynamics that come to play. Um, and so I, I think that's also one of the criticisms of applying the five stages of grief to romantic grief is it's kind of this cookie cutter approach that's mm -hmm. applied to people. And then people start um, evaluating how they're doing processing these stages and they feel like they're not doing it correctly. Well, I'm supposed to be angry now or I'm not supposed to be ready to move on. I, you know, you have people mm -hmm. who process relationships and the ending of a relationship and they're, they're, they're done with it. They're ready to move on. Mm -hmm. And to take them to the through the five stages, it isn't really applicable to what they're going through. So mm -hmm. um, the criticism is it's not a cookie cutter approach, um, and it can't be applied to all forms of grief. Mm -hmm. Now, now you mentioned that um, romantic grief doesn't really fit in well with the traditional stages of grief. Now, from your own research, have you actually come across with a better model that represents romantic grief? Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, again, there isn't a, a one size fits all. There isn't a formula that people can do. And then all of a sudden, boom, they've, they've moved on. Um, it's not a magic pill. But what I try to teach clients based upon my research is that um, I try to teach them uh, strategies instead of stages, uh, take steps instead of trying to go through stages. So my research concluded mm -hmm. with a meta-analysis um, of all the a lot of research that was done on how to grieve the ending of a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I looked at what was the most effective strategies that help people uh, lower depression, lower anxiety, uh, build self-worth, and then also self-reporting that they're ready to be in another relationship. And mm -hmm. what I found was that a, a more brief solution fo focus model, is a more appropriate approach in dealing with romantic grief. So things, approaches that have um, specific strategies um, that take it away from being passive and make it, make it so that the person is in, in more control of their grieving mm -hmm. process and their healing process. Mm -hmm. So things that were solution focused, things that had strategies and things that gave the client or the individual control over their grieving instead of somebody taking them through the uh, stages. Mm -hmm. And, and if you could also expound um, more on how do you actually use this um, information that you gathered from your research on your helping individuals with this information? Yeah, so some um, specific um, strategies that I have found in the research. Um, you know, there was mm -hmm. a um, University of Arizona um, did a study on they, uh, kind of a longitudinal study where they found couples who had just entered into relationships. And they had a kind of a pre-questionnaire for them. And it looked at, they asked them, what were the red flags? What are some things that you are kind of unsure about in this relationship so far mm -hmm. or about the person? What, what kind of makes your gut kind of say, hey, I'm a little bit worried about this. And so they asked mm -hmm. them that question. And then they followed them until the relationship broke up, if it did, if the relationship ended. And they did a, a post-survey. And they asked the same questions. Why? What was the red flag? Why did the relationship end? And 90% of the time, those things matched. So mm -hmm. what they saw in the beginning, what kind of threw up red flags in the beginning were the <clears throat> very reasons the relationship ended. And so that number one strategy sometimes is connect the dots. You mm -hmm. knew that you knew. Um, a lot of times when a relationship ends, there's a shock. There's, I can't believe this. I, 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 don't, I don't know why this happened. And if you can step outside of that and go back and process and look at what were the red flags all along the way, what were even the red flags when I started and got into this relationship, mm -hmm. that kind of takes some of that shock value out of it. And mm -hmm. it's kind of this feeling of, you know what, I knew, I knew these things and I got to learn to trust myself. And so once, if you can get past that shock value of, uh, the relationship ending, it helps to begin to move on and to heal from the relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I've got an interesting question for you, um, based from your experience of you know dealing with pe um, dealing with people who are trying to recover from a breakup. Um, do you have any? Have you come across any myths about romance and breakup? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the biggest myth is that, um, you know, you got to process the stages of grief. Um, mm -hmm. I, another one that I encounter a lot is I just need to find somebody else. Right. Um, so that's not always the best thing. Sometimes um, you have to you have to heal. You have to learn from um, what the relationship was trying to teach you uh, before you mm -hmm. put your baggage and make the same same mistakes in another relationship. Obviously, one of the uh, biggest ones that people do that it's a common mistake that people make is, you know, they turn to unhealthy coping skills, mm -hmm. um, whether that be going out and drinking too much um, or engaging in an unhealthy behavior or risky behavior, kind of running from that pain, running from having to deal and cope with the issues. Um, and so a lot of people do that initially to escape the pain. You know, and I think another thing that people do often um, is that they try to um, add value to the relationship when value wasn't there. Um, to try to make, it's, it's normal for us to make meaning out of things that don't make sense to us. But a lot of times people equate pain with love. So mm -hmm. they're in a relationship, they end the relationship, but they feel this pain and they mm -hmm. feel loss and they feel sorrow. And that they then begin to identify that as, you know what, I must really love this person. It must mean that we're meant to be. It must mean that I need, really need to try and to work on this relationship. And that's not the case. Pain doesn't equal love. And I think a lot of times that's a big myth that people have. And the mm -hmm. lastly, what I want to say is that, you know, a lot of people identify uh, with chronic sorrow. And that mm -hmm. chronic sorrow is another thing that makes um, romantic grief differently. And it's this unique thing that happens when you lose something and all that non-finite loss that we talked about, all those hopes, those dreams. Chronic sorrow is the consistent thought of comparing what was to what I could could have had to what is. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who end um, a romantic relationship or experience a breakup, they ruminate that a lot. They mm -hmm. constantly compare, well, if I was still with this person, we would be doing X, Y, and Z. Or I should have been at this place and this place in time with this person. We should have attended this event. And they kind of keep a running tab on all of those things and then compare it to their life as it is now. And we call that chronic mm -hmm. sorrow. And that's a huge mistake that people make, that you have to sit there and, and compare your life now um, versus your life mm -hmm. what it could have been. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's another thing that I try to work people through is stop mm -hmm. doing that to yourself. You're not helping yourself. You're not helping the healing process at all in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it really reminds me of my, my past relationships, what, what you've said. Um, I, I could actually, uh, you know, remember Remember that the, those are actually really myths, you know, that you think that you could actually recover as soon as, you know, one relationship just 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 finish. Now, obviously, you, you also have um, you 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 uh, from my understanding is just you predominantly focus on helping people recover from relationship. But um, do you have any advice on how to break up gracefully? Yeah, that's a great question. Mm. Yeah, um, I think that one of the things that people do that is a mistake is they, they drag that out. Mm. Uh, and I have a lot of free content on my YouTube page that kind of talks mm. about some of these issues. Um, but one of them is kind of what are the signs that um, it's time to break up? Mm -hmm. um, and so before even the process of breaking up, a lot of people kind of go through this distancing process where they they kind of remove themselves a little bit. They don't do engage in the normal behavior in a relationship. And that really confuses the other person. Mm -hmm. um, and so and that, that makes it more difficult in the process of breaking up. Um, and one of the things that I, I talk about is uh, communication. If, if all communication has broken down in a relationship, if you're not able to listen to the other person's wants, needs, and even complaints, and if they're or they're not able to listen to yours, then that's a good indication that that relationship has run its course. There's no room for healing. There's no room for validation or understanding. And that relationship probably can't recover as it is if all communication has broken down. One of the questions that I like to ask people is, what were your goals last year? Um, what did you say that you were going to accomplish last year compared to this year now? Have you accomplished any of those goals in life? If not, why not? And if for the relationship, if the relationship has consumed so much of your energy in trying to make it work, 
that it's prevented you to, from pursuing other goals, that's a good indication that it's time to break up. Um, and then mm-hmm. the, one of the questions that I ask is, are you better because of this relationship or mm-hmm. are you better in spite of this relationship? Um, when mm-hmm. you look back, a relationship is supposed to be beneficial for you. It's supposed to be comfort. It's supposed to be joy. It's supposed to help you grow. They're not easy, but they are supposed to be good. And if a relationship haven't, hasn't given you those things, you can be um, addicted to the wrong things. You mm-hmm. can still want the negative things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, mm-hmm. you know, negative attention is still attention. So if somebody's giving you that negative attention, you still sometimes are addicted to it. And so mm-hmm. in order to break up gracefully, as you asked, you got to have, you got to be sure, you got to know that. And so take the time to really think about some of those questions and then communicate honestly. You know, it doesn't help to put anything off on somebody else or something else. You know, take ownership of things. I don't feel this way anymore. I can't do this anymore. Being honest, though it's difficult, is the shortest way and the quickest way uh, to produce healing. Okay. And um, based from your experience, um, do you think that post-break... up is a good idea. I'm sorry, post breakup meeting. Um, is, yeah. is it a good idea? So, uh, getting together after the relationship is, yeah, ended? yeah, uh, no, and unless it is for um, uh, parental obligations, unless you have a child and there are some responsibilities that you have, mm-hmm. um, as a parent, then, um, no, and even that should be limited, uh, in, in my suggestion. You know, um, a lot of people who are involved in, in the grief work surrounding romantic relationships talk about a no contact rule. And so I, I'm in favor of that. So in my book, I talk about um, at least seven days, no contact. You mm-hmm. got to get over some of the initial rush of emotions. Um, and in this period of time that you're in, um, after the breakup, post breakup, you're going to feel a lot of different emotions. And it's important not to act on emotions at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So um, when I had a private practice, uh, one of the things that I was telling, asking people when they came in and they were dealing with this issue is, are you still in contact with your ex? Do you still follow them on social media? Mm -hmm. And nine times out of 10, it was, yes, I still follow them. I still have contact. We still talk, we still text. And then they wonder why it's so difficult to move on from the relationship. If you are still in contact with the person, um, then that's not going to help the healing process. One of the things that I talk about in my book is um, what I've labeled as the gangsters of grief. And these are the characters that show their face after a relationship. These are the things that you don't want to be like. Mm -hmm. And also, if you identify these things in your ex, how to um, handle these things. And one of those I call the fisherman. And this is somebody who's constantly fishing for a reaction, right? They're asking you about what are you doing this weekend? They're asking about family. They're asking about information that they don't need to know because they are no longer in a relationship with you. They also throw out, it's, it's bait, right? They're throwing out things. They're trying to reel you it back in. And um, sometimes whether it's negative attention or positive attention, whether it's negative reaction or positive reaction, if they feel that you bite a little bit, they're going to they're gonna pull back and try to reel you in. So, for example, they might say things like in a text message, well, I know you hate me. And they, that's just eliciting a response. They want you to bite on that. They want you to respond to that. Or I don't love you anymore. Or mm-hmm. I know you don't love me anymore. And mm-hmm. these are all things that are trying to get you to react emotionally. Mm-hmm. And when I say you react negatively, you could yell at the person. You could tell them, yes, I hate you. You've hurt me so much. Or you can say, you know, I I do love you. You know I love you. No matter what the response is, that's not the Mm -hmm. point. The point is they're trying to reel you back in. Um, Mm -hmm. And so these are the things that post-relationship, why having contact with somebody makes Mm -hmm. it very tricky and messy and complicated and difficult. What Mm -hmm. needs to happen is you need to focus on your healing. You need to learn from the relationship. You need to focus on your healing and to move on. Um, the, the cycle of getting back together, getting, uh, breaking up, getting back together, it's just a tar pit. It's a roller coaster of emotions that nobody deserves and rarely does it, does it really work out if there's an on again, off again, on again, off again relationship. Mm -hmm. And 
also based from your experience is there like a certain personality trait who are more let's shall we say more um adept at recovering from breakout great question you know yeah. attachment theory um has a lot um and a lot of work within the the grief uh, especially of relationships, you know, how you I attach to people, if you have secure attachments or you have insecure attachments. Um, and that's, that's a little bit difficult to process post breakup because somebody again is looking for that immediate need. And it's really hard to go back and process all of the things of your past, your relationship with your parents. That takes a lot of time. Um, so that, again, that's why a solution focused model is the best approach, mm -hmm. but yes, people have insecure attachment styles they're going to cling mm. to people more. They're going to need that validation more. They're going to chase that person more. Um, a, a, another chapter in my book is about um, that I, how relationship plays a role of giving you acts as a mirror. It's kind of that, that feedback loop. It's where you get that self-identity from. Mm -hmm. And one of the key things is being able to find a different mirror. You know, in a relationship, you're constantly, every day, there's a feedback loop happening. It, it tells you who you are, where you are in life, what you have in life, makes you feel good, gives you validation. And those who can find another mirror, um, those who can find their worth in other things, one of the things that I talk about is having a routine, establishing a routine post-breakup. And what that routine does, maybe that's exercise, maybe that's meeting with a friend, um, all of those things be begin to... Um, become that new feedback loop. That's mm -hmm. that next mirror that you need to regain that self-identity. Again, remember that a breakup is a blow to that self-identity and, and that self-worth. And so finding people who are secure enough and kind of have self-actualized enough to find something else to give me that information instead of the relationship, those tend to recover a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you've already mentioned about your book and what's actually in some of the chapters. Now, if you could just tell us what's the title of your book and um, is it available in Kindle? Yeah, it's uh, available on Amazon for download or for hard copy. Uh, it's called The Breakup Breakthrough, mm -hmm. Research Strategies to Recover from a Relationship Faster. Mm -hmm. And really, kind of everything that we've talked about is kind of the layout of the book. First, mm -hmm. talking about why you can't uh, apply the five stages why romantic grief is so different. Um, and then also, uh, why, why do I feel so much pain? And again, people associate pain with, I must be with that person. It must meant to be, they're my soulmate. And really what's going on biologically that's causing that pain may not have anything to do with the relationship and the person has mm -hmm. more to do with body chemistry and hormones and things like that that are biological. And so it lays that out in the first couple chapters and it starts to talk about what are the strategies. You know, I really hate books that you have to read six or seven chapters to get to the meat of it. This is a quick, easy read, about 100 pages. Um, and it gets right into here's the strategies. Here's strategy one, here's strategy two. Um, and again, it's not a magic pill, but it is the solution focused model that gives you strategies to no longer be passive in your grieving process. Mm -hmm. And from what I can sense is that this book is not only just for people who are obviously trying to recover from a relationship, but it's also for people who are interested in this research area. Because I think a lot of uh, um, what you have included in this book is based from your own research. That's correct. So yeah. This Thank could you. also Thank be you. for yeah. academics or for students. Absolutely. And I, I cite everywhere that I, I quote something, um, as you should. Uh, but, you know, one of my frustrations, too, on um, there's a lot of self-help books out there mm -hmm. uh, about recovering from a relationship. And the reason one of the reasons why I wrote this book was because a lot of those aren't written by people who are backing it up with research. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's, hey, I've been through this. I, mm -hmm. I experienced a, a breakup. This is what I did. It mm -hmm. worked for me. So maybe it will work for you. And not to knock them, but that's not evidence, an evidence based mm -hmm. approach. Um, and that's, it's still needed. They, they people still get something out of that. There's validation. Oh, I'm not the only one who's gone through those feelings mm -hmm. or those experiences. So those things have its place, but this is, um, coming from more of an evidence-based approach. Mm -hmm. uh, again, not a magic pill, but these are the things that research shows helps in these areas. Brilliant book. I'll put the link and, um, on, on the description 
question back about your book and also um, everything else that we talk about. But um, just just um, remind us um, what's in the pipeline for your brand. Do you have any future um, speaking engagements? Yeah, great question. Thanks webinar. for asking. Uh, currently providing online coaching sessions for mm -hmm. those that are um, experiencing a breakup, um, kind of on that that um, that that realm of I, I think I need to break up. I think I want to break up all the way to people who have experienced a divorce two years ago and are still really suffering from that grief and can't seem to move on. So um, providing those online coaching sessions, um, the book is available, trying to promote the book. Um, and and I'm, I'm constantly trying to learn. I'm constantly trying to do more research and kind of fine tune how to best help people in this situation. Mm -hmm. And are you also in social media? Yes, absolutely. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, on YouTube, on Facebook. Um, Dr. CM Sense um, is my, my handle on all those or the Breakup Breakthrough. The BreakupDoc.com is my website. Um, and so, yes, they can fi find me and please follow me on social media. Mm -hmm. um, um, the Breakup Doctor, it's been an insightful conversation with you, but unfortunately our time is up. And uh, thank you for sharing with us your expertise and your time. Um, we look forward to hearing more about your work and, of course, um, about your book. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I very much appreciate it. Thank you.